Mikhail, thank you very much for, for your time today. I think it's going to be great to hear your career, how it's progressed, but more importantly, some of the industry insights that you've got as well, because I know you've been around for, for quite a while and you've, you've done a lot in your career. And I think everyone's going to really get a lot of value from this conversation. So as a starting point, could I just get a, an intro to who you are, what you do and what you've done? That'd be fantastic. Sure. Sure, absolutely. So my name is Kees Bachman. Um, right now, I'm a technical director for engines computing within the desktop services business unit uh, for Nutanix. Um, in that role, I lead a team of highly skilled architects that write our reference architectures, best practice guides, solution notes. Um, because we write the reference architectures, we do a lot of benchmarking. Um, and that means that sometimes we'll push our products to its limits and sometimes we'll go over those limits. And that's where um, uh, the little bit of R&D comes that we do as well, um, because we'll go back to engineering, talk to them what we did, what we've, uh, what we expected, and what we need to change to make it even better. And um, kind of the last part of my team's responsibility is uh, um, we engage with customer and, and field teams when there's a large scale opportunity or something really complex or the SE or the, the sales rep is not comfortable with that, then they can pull us in and we'll have a chat with the, with the customer or the partner uh, like yourself um, about, you know, kind of the requirements, what's the dot on the horizon, how we can define that and how we can get there from, uh, from, from the point that, that we are. So that's basically what I do today. Um, do you want me to elaborate on uh, how I got there or do you yeah, want to please, ask yeah. a question? Yes, what's the history been? What's the progression in the journey, shall we say? Oh, it's it's an interesting one, right? So um, back when I uh, was still at university, um, I had a, a side job. I worked at a, an ISP as a, a help desk employee. And this was still in the uh, the dial-up phase, right? So I had customers on the on the phone that tried to uh, to dial up with their uh, with their dial-up connections and um, uh, not not long after that, IACN came up with uh, the, so you could dial up and actually have a phone call. Um, we started the ADSL, uh, so the broadband department, and I was one of the first employees on, on the help desk, and, and that kind of got me going. Um, I was a, I was late, so I was 19 when I got my first own computer. Um, and started kind of dabbling around with that, mainly because I had that side job, but also because I was involved with some chat groups, um, learned myself HTML coding and, and, and all that comes with, with that. And that kind of evolved into um, uh, newer roles. Um, got a, another help desk. Just after that, I got a help desk job, which was supporting a lot of customers that were actually using uh, remoting protocols like Citrix. And that got me kind of attached to the whole end user computing game, although I didn't know it at that point in time. Uh, I spent some time with Sun as a web developer. So I, I, um, uh, at that time, we did a project to, uh, to redesign sun.com. And I was part of that team, uh, learned Perl in the progress. Um, can't touch it with a, with a 10, full, 10 foot stick right now, but I, I used to be pretty sufficient in, uh, in Perl. Uh, and that kind of uh, progressed in, in a, um, um, uh, a job in, at a, a very small um, uh, partner that uh, basically did a lot of um, um, uh, SMB. So it's anywhere between five and 500 desktops or 500 and 500 employees, we did, we did uh, IT services in the broadest scope of the word. So it was phones, cameras, it was computers, uh, desktops, laptops, servers, uh, SQL Exchange, Active Directory, basically anything they could throw at us, um, they did, and, and we tried to, uh, to kind of help with that. Um, and I found myself doing that for about four or five years. And after the, like the, the, the 300 uh, exchange installation, I got kind of, uh, bored is not the right way to describe it, but you know, at a certain point, we had everything automated. We had a scripting framework because we did a lot of similar work. So we had a, a script framework and uh, I helped design that framework. And at some point you just look at your work and go like, all right, that's something I've done for, for quite a few times. The excitement is gone. I need something else to kind of um, grow above that. Um, so I, I went looking for a new job, landed at one of the biggest privately owned system integrators in the Netherlands, um, worked there for almost six years, went from system engineer to senior consultant and solution architect. Um, 
and I wanted to see bigger environments, right? So I, um, I was dabbling around in these five to 500 kind of seats um, deployments. Uh, I wanted to see something bigger because I, at that time, I thought that was more challenging. So I landed a spot as a solution architect uh, for a uh, Citrix environment for 28,000 seats. Uh, so it was a little bit bigger than uh, than I, uh, I I've done before, but uh, I had a really good kind of mentor in in that in that project who helped me immensely with um, kind of navigating through the uh, the the quirks and the pitfalls of an enterprise, um, just to find out that the complexity of a twenty eight thousand seat deployment isn't far away from the one that is five hundred desktops. You need a little bit more infrastructure, but all of the complexity is is similar, right? Applications are applications, users are users. You just have more of, of them. So, um, I, I guess that's one of my lessons learned, and I know we'll chat about that later on. But um, you know, from from my perspective, that that kind of surprised me at the time um, because I was expecting a lot more, like a lot more coming at me, and you know, in volume it was, but in in kind of complexity, they're they're equal. Um, so I stayed, I stayed on that project for about two years, um, did a lot of work um, for, for the SI, and then uh, the opportunity came with Nutanix. And I first, and this is a, a, a well-known secret, but I first interviewed, um, got roped in, a, in in an interview as an SE, um, which uh, I got declined to. Uh, they hired a, a, a chap called Martin Boshart. Uh, he came from Citrix. He has a ton of experience in, the, in, in that field. Uh, and they wanted an experienced SE, and I wasn't that experienced in an SE role. So they hired him. And two weeks later, um, I got a ping from uh, from one of my good friends, Raymond Epping, who was one of the first employees in the Netherlands for, for Nutanix. And he said, I've got this role in the performance solution engineering team, and it fits you perfectly. It, it, you can break stuff, we'll pay you for it, and uh, uh, that's, that's a role that you want to take. So... Um, did the interviews, got through five rounds. Remember one of the rounds... Um, I was sitting in my car. It was during the vacation period in the Netherlands. It was like 34, 35 degrees outside. I was sitting in my, in my shorts, in my car, and the air conditioning turned on. Uh, we were on vacation. So I did an hour uh, call with um, um, one of the, um, at that time, one of, one of the senior leaders, Sunil Puri, who came from Citrix, who worked for Nutanix as a VP of product for a while. Um, and we basically chatted about Netscaler for an hour. Um, so that was a, that was an interesting uh, interesting round of uh, of conversations, and w one thing that stood out to me in, in all of that, those conversations is that everybody that I talked to was really really smart, like uh, in an insane level smart, um, and that really got me kind of hyped up about the job role because I was like, wow, if I can work with all these smart people, um, what would my work look like? What would my career look like in in three, five, six years? Um, and I actually thought I, I blew the uh, the last interview um, as one of the, um, the guys who was a uh, turned out to be a, a, a Cisco vet. He worked for Cisco for 20 years and then moved to Nutanix. Um, obviously, we started chatting about end user computing, uh, but you know, obviously, with a Cisco uh, or a former Cisco employee, it went uh, networking quite rapidly. And um, the first few questions were easy uh, on the on the, um, the network communication stack and MAC addresses and whatnot. And then he started talking about OSPF and BGP mm -hmm. uh, or BPG. And I just I just had to say, listen, this is not my field of expertise. Um, I don't know uh, what this would look like because that's typically not what I deal with. I know VLANing, I know firewalling. I know how to route networks across. Uh, I know how that works in a desktop virtual or virtualization world. But if you're talking about um, uh, that side of networking, that's just not my comfort zone. And I thought I, I blew my interview, uh, but it was actually, it turned out later, and, and this might be interesting for your for our listeners as well, turned out later that he was just trying to search for my boundaries. Hmm. And uh, he explained that he was searching for me, or the moment where I would say, hey, listen, this is as far as I can go. This is where my field of expertise is. So uh, basically what I'm trying to say is don't, don't be afraid to say, hey, this is not my field of expertise. I don't know this. Because it's better, and that goes across your career. It's better to say, I don't know this. I can pick this up. I can learn. Uh, but right now I can't give you a, a, an answer than to bluff your way through it 
and lose your face when uh, when you're not right in the in the end. So um, for me, that was a, a very kind of telling moment in the in 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 the in the interview phase. Yeah, speaking to um, I had a, a guy on the other evening who's a recruiter, he's an IT recruiter. So I thought it'd be nice to hear his side of the fence of working in the technology industry. And he was giving some top tips for preparing for interviews and all those kind of things. And his one of his takeaways was prepare to say no, right? Yeah. Be honest with yourself because if you go in there and try and bull your way through it and just lie, and then when you do get the role and they think you know OSPF and EBGP and everything else and you don't, and the first thing they do is put you on a customer site to configure that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to yep. go very well. Um, so it was quite an interesting one with that from his side of the fence with an IT recruitment point. He was just saying, normally a lot of recruiters I've worked with in the past were kind of like, tell them everything you can do. And if you can talk about it and still talk about it, whereas I, I think just just tell everyone what you can do, be honest where you can't, because actually straight away as, a, as someone that hires in, in, into CDW as well for my team, I want to know where, where the limits are and how much development you need versus you saying you can do it all and I hire you and find you that, that you can't. And I think the other thing as well when you're hiring people is, is I don't necessarily look for the technology anymore because most people that come into a, a high performing team like yourselves, like mine, and, and you're expected to know these things anyway by default, I don't ask that many technical questions. What I'm actually trying to find out is, do you have the right attitude? Are you gonna deliver what we expect you to deliver? Have you got the, the ethic to carry on working and get things resolved? rather than you're the best technical person since sliced bread because those no, people 100%, 100%, 100%. I, I rather contain uh culture than uh, uh attract top talent that kind of messes with uh, the overall culture of a high performing team Ab absolutely yeah definitely cool so that's, that's a really cool like, little transition i think what a lot of people have been talking about in these sessions is how they've gone from a support role first line support answering password resets putting print toner in right all the way through to them becoming, in some cases, a CTO, uh, like one of the guys we had another evening. And I think the lesson learned that I've got just by having these conversations with people so far is, is that the most rounded individuals that I've spoke to are the people that started out in support and then had the attitude and desire to progress to whatever level they wanted to progress to. So I think that understanding customer requirements is what you get from being a support engineer, how to put up with no and knock back and people shouting at you ultimately, which is what you get on support quite a lot. It's something that you get hardened to by doing that process and skipping that that part of your career, I think is a is a big no. Um, and I think a lot of people should actually go back there at least once or twice in their career, even when they've got to a certain point, just to have a sense of realism, what it's like on that side of the fence again. Absolutely, and it, it goes multiple ways, right? So for me, it, it kind of developed my, um, um, my, my, my skills to analyze problems. When you have somebody on the phone and you're not able to see their screen, not see their faces, and just need to go by the information that you have, you learn how to ask questions and ask the right questions. And that helped me kind of develop in my career. So it's, it's not just the, um, the social aspect of, of having people shout at you, uh, which, you know, to a certain point, I've got four kids, so I've got that at home. Uh, it, but uh, th that helps in kind of dealing with people. But for, for me, the biggest plus was to be able to ask a few questions and understand what the problem was. I think that helps in, in uh, advancing your career as well. Because if I'm on a phone call with the customer right now, um, I'm not saying that I always ask the right questions. But I know when I'm asking the wrong questions, because that will deviate the conversation. right? So it, it, it definitely helps with, uh, with getting, getting to the point uh, real quick. Um, and like you said, if, if we're... Um, like yourself and, and part of what I do, if we're designing infrastructure uh, or services for our customers, I think the, the last thing that we keep in mind is service desk employees. Mm -hmm. While they're, they might be just as important as your end user, because in the end, they're supporting the infrastructure. If they're not happy, then you're building a solution that is not a good fit for that organization. No, exactly. There's been a lot of talk on these sessions around DevOps and infrastructure as code and all those kind of things. And for as much as I think that's Definitely the way people should be looking at doing things to an extent. I think the challenge is, is that that learning curve for non-developers to write code to manage their infrastructure that are used to just doing click and point GUI driven activities is just, it doesn't happen overnight. And the amount of failure and things that could go wrong in the short term whilst they're finding their feet on that platform is going to be something to be seen, right? Because a lot of people haven't done it yet, but it's going to be an interesting uh, support conundrum, shall we say. 
as with a lot of these things, I think that DevOps is a two-way street, right? So first of all, you've got technology stack. Um, people need to learn how to code, how to write code, how to write code in a way that is repeatable. And um, if I write code, I want you to be able to understand and read it and modify it and vice versa. That's one part. The other part is the, um, the mentality, mindset, and culture. And if those two worlds are not kind of combined and they're not working towards each other, they could implement DevOps as much as you want, but it will never ever work. So it's, it's, it's this yin and yang of, of technology and culture. And you need to enable people on the technology front, but you also need to realize that a lot of these folks have been, like you said, have been using a, a UI and, and processes and uh, service now and, and whatnot to uh, to uh, kind of establish whatever they need to be whatever needs to be done. So if you want to to have a true DevOps kind of mentality, you have to bring those two worlds together. And I I, I think from from my point point of view, people are are forgetting either uh, one way or the other. And if you over rotate on on one or the other, then your project won't won't be successful at all. Yeah, I definitely agree with that statement. So. What would you say is the most memorable moment of your career today? Oh, <laughs> um, I think I've got a few. Um, and the, the one that stands out was the one, uh, and it's not a big, big thing, right? So uh, I, I remember a customer calling um, around 4 p.m. that their exchange environment was down. Um, and we tried to help remotely, then work out. Uh, we had an engineer driving to the customer. Turns out that their their uh, sysadmin at the time tried to add a new exchange server, and that went horribly wrong. Uh, but the um, the admin went home. He was like, "Well, I'll, I'll fix this tomorrow." But he didn't realize that the email was down. Um, so we had to jump in. Um, I got called. I jumped in. Um, and I think it was like 3 a.m. when we got the exchange uh, environment back online and everybody, well, you know, the people that could test it were, uh, were able to work. Um, for me, it wasn't a matter of, they, like, it wasn't a big thing, right? It was just technology gone wrong. Uh, but the, the, the thing that stands out to me the most was the people around me, the, the colleagues that I worked with, they were all online. They were all helping out. They were all kind of sitting there with us b between my colleague and me, trying to help and, and think and, and take a step back and, and say, all right, so this is the situation, we're here right now, uh, this is where we need to be, what are the potential steps to take? <coughs> so it's, it's memorable in a way that um, my um, employer at that time has had forced a, a team that had a sense of urgency, had a sense of ownership uh, for the the problems that our customers and and that um, I, I I guess that sends out to me because I want that for my teams right I want my teams to be like that in, in terms of in terms of um, ownership accountability uh, but also kind of the the camaraderie um, as well yeah ex exactly that um, you don't let somebody sit at three a.m. in the data center just to figure it out you just sit with them and try to figure that out together and that's something that that stood out to me. Yeah, definitely. Two heads are always better than one in, in some of those circumstances, right? It's like, I remember years ago, because when I first started out in IT, I wanted to be a developer, right? I wanted to write the next cool app, right? Mm -hmm. Just because I was from college and I thought that's what developers did. And I got a job doing um, what I thought would be, would be creating new software, but it wasn't. It was writing glorified SQL queries to pull data out of a database and put it in the table on screen for people. Wasn't quite what I was expecting as a developer. Um, but I remember doing, trying to build something myself and I spent hours and hours and hours looking at why this code wouldn't debug and what wasn't there. And it was ultimately one full stop, right? In the wrong place. And I'm talking maybe 15, 16, 17 years ago and the debugging tool wasn't fantastic. So I couldn't see where that full stop was. And then I had one guy that just came over to me and he just went, it's there. And then just right. walked yeah. I didn't even say anything else. And I just looked at it, I was like, ah. So like, I think asking for that help and doing that is 100% is needed. And and having that trust in your team that, you, that they're not going to sit there and go, oh, not again, or why, why is this guy employed, right? You should know this stuff. 
Absolutely. And especially at, at like stressful moments uh, late at night where you've been working for hours and hours just straight looking at that same problem. It, it helps to have a fresh pair of eyes saying like literally, like you said, um, you need to change this. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Okay, so what, what would you say is the, the biggest mistake that you made and the lesson you learned from it? <laughs> oh, I make mistakes every single day. Um, I think the, the biggest mistake that I make um, is not to, not to make mistakes. So if, and this is a, a more philosophical, uh, philosophical answer, but you know, if, if you look at the bigger picture, I think um, um, at my, at one of my previous employers, we had two guys um, employed that um, did a lot of kind of um, uh, inspirational talks. And what they did was um, talking about failure and how failure is a must. And that opened up my eyes. So what they, what they were talking about was that if you never fail, it means you're always doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing the same thing, there's no chance of failure because you've done it a hundred thousand times and you know, you know how it works. And I think the, um, the biggest mistake that I've made uh, through my career, or if I need to define one, is that uh, I've been too comfortable for too long in, in certain positions, right? At some point, you just do your work. You you know you're you're sufficient at it because people like you and and you're getting through projects quite rapidly and whatnot. Um, never get too comfortable in the position that you are. Always try to at least for myself. Um, uh, I always try to strive for more, uh, better, best, um, just to challenge myself. Um, and I think that um, it's not a, a mistake in terms of doing something wrong, or uh, it's more a, a thing that I think I, I can do better, or, or people should do better if, if they want to progress in their career. Uh, don't, don't take comfort in the place that you are, strive for the place that you want to be. Yeah, and I think a lot of people on these sessions have been saying very similar things, right, where they got into a, a role in an organization, they got very comfortable in that role, they spent most the largest part of their career to date in that part of their career. So I know that I think Simon Murdoch on the first episode that, that we sent out, he, he said that he was working in the reseller space for, I'm going to try and remember, we'll say 10 years, right, and he was doing the same role for 10 years, and then he, he reckons that he learned maybe one year's worth of information over those 10 years of usable content, right? And then he then went and became CTO for a distribution company in the UK. And he said he's probably learned five years worth of stuff in the last 18 months in that role. Yeah. And for him, it's like, that was the same situation he was in, which was he just lost his desire or his, his goal or what he was aiming for. And then all of a sudden, someone lit a fire on his backside and he decided to to try and do something more, which is now why he's where he is. And uh, uh, like, uh, um, it does, it's every, every individual is different, right? And sometimes you're just comfortable with being comfortable. Like that's, and that's fine, right? If, if, if you're in a good spot and you get, you get the work done that you need to do and there's a good work life balance and all of that, then I'm not, I'm not the one that, that will tell you that you need to get more out of your life. I'm just saying that if I look back on my own per, uh, career progression, um, um, I need to be careful not getting comfortable with the role that I'm in. I, I need to kind of, and that's what you see in, in kind of my, um, if you would go to my LinkedIn, you probably see that every six to six months to a year, maybe a year and a half, I change roles and not in, in a very different role, but I just progress. And the way that I uh, try to achieve that, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the way that I try to achieve that is to set short-term goals, something that is realistic. And I'll talk to uh, whoever is my manager or my senior at that point in time, and I'll ask them, what do you expect from me in the next six to 12 months? That way I know what, what their goals are and how, can I, how I can align my goals to their goals. Because in the end, uh, you've got company goals, you've got personal goals, and you're most successful if, you, if you're able to align those two um, uh, together because that positions you in a, um, in a, in a position where, where you drive for your own goals. There's something for yourself. And it's also beneficial for, uh, for the company you work for, the team that you work for, or um, your own career. Yeah, definitely. And would you say you've made any sacrifices on the way? <laughs> 
Um, I, I wouldn't call it sacrifices. I call it choices. Um, like I said, I've, I've got four kids at home. Um, I've got a wonderful wife. Um, the life at Nutanix does take a lot of time and I let it take time. Uh, that is a, a choice that, uh, that I make uh, together with my wife. Um, in terms of sacrifices, I think the choice for me right now, well, not now due to COVID, there's not, not a lot of flying around, but um, uh, let's say uh, um, pre-COVID, I did a lot of flying. I was in the, in, in the air a lot, traveling to, uh, to customers and events and, and, and offices. Um, those are choices that we've made. My wife is comfortable with that. She doesn't mind, uh, but that also means that sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm away for a week for my wife and kids. Um, I wouldn't call that a sacrifice. I would call that a choice. Yeah. I think it's um, um, depending on who you are and how you look at work. Um, these things are not sacrifices. They're choices. Mm -hmm. it, to me, a sacrifice, and that might be a translation into Dutch, but uh, to me, a sacrifice is something negative. It has a negative ring to it, whereas choice um, could still be negative. <laughs> but at least I, I may I make the decision, whereas a sacrifice is something that is predefined. At least that's that's how I look at it. Um, so if if we're talking about choices, then it's our choice for me to uh, to be uh, on the road every once in a while. Um, but as long as my kids don't mind and my wife is still okay with it, then uh, you know it's it's a choice that um, should help me in uh, in in kind of who I am and what defines me in terms of work and and and, and private. Yeah, and happy wife, happy life, right? So, got to get, got to bring them on the decision, mate, on the decision tree. <laughs> uh, that, that, no, ab absolutely, and I guess that's a that, that's a good kind of uh, new tip is or um, additional tip is make sure that you you talk to to your spouse, make sure that they're happy with what you're doing. Um, typically, like my work weeks are not forty hours. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're less, sometimes they're much more. Uh, the balance is in, in the much more scale, but um, again, it's it's a it's a matter of kind of trying to combine um, work and, and life. Uh, they're, one of the perks of working for for the company I work for is that I can bring my school my kids to school when I'm when I'm at home. I can pick them up from school. I can go um, uh, kickboxing lessons or or, or football lessons. Um, I, we do have that flexibility, but it also means that after eight p.m. I'm probably working. Mm -hmm. But my kids, my younger two kids are in bed at that time. My older two kids are watching Netflix anyway, so I, I don't get any attention. Um, so that leaves some uh, some room for me to actually do some work. Yeah, definitely. Would you say there's been any point in your career where it's, it's got you to a point of wanting to quit and then you've overcome it in any way? Um, I'm not much of a quitter, um, but I did have a, a one customer that uh, that you know, made me realize how fragile the world is in, in terms of IT. Um, we, uh, we won uh, the RFP. I, I did a lot of design work for them. And during the, um, the actual um, deployment, it turns out that they actually wanted something completely different. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as with everything, change is hard for a lot of people. Uh, so I said, all right, let's let's talk about what you want to do different. And we discussed it. And basically, they started pushing um, my limits, but also the company's limits, which, um, you know, made me come home grumpy and, and kind of sit down and went like, I don't know how to uh, get out of this situation. And uh, basically, what I did was talk to my best friend, who's uh, also my wife. So we just sat down. And she said, what's, what's going on? So I started explaining. And while I was explaining, I, were, I was already giving my boundaries and, and setting kind of the, the limits for myself. And she looked at me and she said, why don't you talk to, why don't you say this, exactly this to your customer? And I was like, well, I don't know. And she said, well, if, if this is how you feel, if this is what you're seeing, just explain it to them. And that's what we did. So I, I went back the, the other day, sat with the customer and exactly said what I said to my wife, um, that I think they're, uh, they're, they're testing my boundaries and this is as far as we can go um, in terms of investment, in terms of finance, in terms of um, the additional value that, that uh, we could bring in that project. And that kind of turned around in a conversation where they understood 
that um, they were shifting uh, their requirements from like completely different uh, requirements. Um, and that, that moment for me was also a moment of uh, realization that if you open up, if you were able to be vulnerable, um, you know, it, and it's, it's a, a, a scary thing being vulnerable. You know, opening up is, is not easy, especially not towards customers because you want to be uh, that person that gives advice and, and, and leads them. Uh, but in this case, it actually uh, made a lot of sense and helped us progress the project. Yeah, definitely. It is always a challenge when that happens, right? And I think I remember seeing a t-shirt once about solutions architects, right? Is this like glorified educated guesswork? So it's <laughs> getting people's opinions and trying to make sense of them most of the time. Absolutely. And it doesn't help when you have moving goalposts. So defining the goalposts and, and defining where they are kind of helps in, uh, in, in getting things done. Yeah, definitely. So top three tips, if you're looking back at yourself um, when you first started out or when you decided to pivot your career, um, what would be your top three tips that you, you would like to follow now? Set goals, set realistic goals, short-term goals. Uh, like I said, don't look at yourself in 12, 18, uh, 24 months, because that will be completely different by the time you get there. Mm -hmm. Set short-term goals, three months, six months, maybe nine months. Do that. Make sure that you align them with uh, your senior management. Um, don't be afraid to skip level. So if you have a manager that doesn't listen to you, don't be afraid to talk to who's ever uh, above that, because uh, we're all human beings. Uh, we all have a, our own point of view. Uh, so um, part of it, part of that advice is me being Dutch and we don't do well in, uh, in uh, hierarchical uh, environments. So we, we, we tend to skip level anyway. Um, and be honest, like just be honest with who you are, what you do and what you're able to do and how you can pick things up. And I think that um, those three will progress your career. Um, and it won't be easy. Nothing is like, don't expect people to hand it to you. That might be tip number four, if, if I may. Um, if you're looking at work, people will never hand it to you. You have to earn it. You have to go for it. You have to make sure that you take the boxes yourself before people will do it for you. Yeah, I remember asking, and, um, I, think it was, I think it was Jim, Jim Moyle, a good many years back now when I first met him. And I said to him, well, how do you get to becoming a CTP? Right? And he just turned to me and he went, you don't aim to become a CTP. You just become a CTP or something along those lines, right? It was like, literally don't aim for it. You'll get given it if you're worthy. Yeah, that's that's 100%. It, it, something like that, a title should not be a goal. It should be an effect. So if you want to do, if, if you contribute to the, to the community, you'll get these titles by yourself. Yeah. Uh, it should not be a goal by itself because that way you're losing the, the, um, the actual kind of, concept of of something like a ctp or a v expert or an ntc or whatever community title i think for me um having a few having a few of them um it came because i cared about the community i wanted to mentor people and, and help them mentor is a big word but help them in you know solving problems solving situations i and i'm, I'm just opinionated so i wanted to give my opinion um about the euc space and that kind of we kind of resulted into uh, getting a CTP title, a V expert title, a login VSI, and, and NVIDIA. Yeah, definitely. And I know one of my guys has been saying that he wants to get a community title. I was like, that's great. What community work are you doing? And he was like, no, I was like, well, you're not going to get a community title. And it's as simple as that. Uh, so yeah. you know, Doesn't work there. Sharing your knowledge, experiences, and just having an opinion. I think one of the things I try and advocate within my team is if you don't know the answer, or it's not your expert, expert area, but you have an opinion of it, still share your opinion because people are potentially paying you a considerable amount of money to have an opinion in a lot of the cases. And they're using that opinion to then make an informed decision. Whether they want to follow your advice or not is another question, but at least you've then provided your, your approach. Sometimes you just give an advice in a different point of view. Um, just to give you an example, yesterday we were um, discussing a, um, a very large deployment where we want to uh, provision a, a full stack solution with automation. Um, we had automation experts on the on the call, um, and I'm 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 an end user computing guy, right? So I, I hardly know about automation, um, just about the, the the stuff that we need for our work. Um, 
and they were chatting about interfaces and whatnot. And I just stepped in and went, well, what if we built this in a concept form? And they, they kind of, they stopped talking for a while. It, you, it, you could notice it took them three or four seconds just to kind of sink that in. And they went, well, we hadn't thought about that. Now I'm, I'm nowhere near an expert in, in, in anything. Uh, the, the biggest expertise I have is failing. Um, but giving a, a different point of view about a topic that you might not really know about kind of helps others as well, because you're coming from it from your angle and that's a unique angle anyway. So that might help progress other people in, in kind of getting ideas and, and building stuff out. Yeah, awesome. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's take a change. Let's talk about industry, right? So obviously a lot has changed in the industry since, since we started out, but what would you say the biggest change has been um, since you started? So the biggest change that I'm seeing is that IT is being forced to step out their ivory tower, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, I remember where the IT admin was kind of dictating how IT should look like, whereas now um, that power is where it belongs with the end user. Yeah. And um, I say that with a lot of confidence. Not every end user will be able to kind of cope with that, with that freedom. Um, so the, the biggest problem that we face in, in, in the industry is, is kind of supplying that spectrum of people who are not able to deal with all the chains and um, the responsibility and, and autonomous uh, versus the, the road warriors and the generation Y, generation X that want to bring their own device and uh, they want to consume their own services. They swipe their credit card whenever needed. So uh, that, that whole spectrum of people who are, um maybe kind of stuck in what they did um like i the example that i always give is that, uh, at one of the projects that we did is we uh we upgraded one of their their line of business applications and the icon was still in the same place on their desktop it just went from uh, blue to red like the icon was the same same icon just went from blue to red and we had people calling into the help desk because they couldn't find their application anymore hmm. so we still have people like that in the workforce, like in the overall workforce, there are a lot of people like that. On the other hand, we, ha we have uh, people coming from school, they're, they're whiz kids, they're, they're kind of matured with technology, right? Th those are the kind of, kind of people that walk up to a screen and start tapping it, and they're surprised if it's not a touch screen. Now that kind of spectrum uh, brings in a lot of complexity because it's easy to serve one or the other. But everything in between is, is hard. And I guess the biggest change in our industry is the aspiration to support all of that and the technology stack to go with it. So if you look at um, VMware Workspace ONE or uh, the uh, Citrix Intelligent Workspace or Workspace with Intelligence, I don't know what the official name is right now, but you see that there's a, a, a shift in workflows in terms of what we offer to that end user. And that kind of helps us um, Kind of service all of that that spectrum in in terms of end users yeah definitely i think um when i've been speaking to people i've been talking about service oriented it understanding what service is delivering how it's then delivered and consumed but i think i was speaking to, to my friend who i mentioned earlier who's who's gone into a technical leadership role in an organization a board it's a very small organization right it's like 100 people um but he was saying that the biggest challenge he's got is where they put their focus because it's a very small reseller. And I was kind of like, well, this naively, right, from the workspace world and, and the EUC world, I was like, well, there's, there's three things in my mind that are never going to go away, right? So, and that is going to be the network you need to connect to your services, the end device that you need to connect and the security wrap that goes around that to make sure that things don't get stolen. Mm -hmm. the data center might change the cloud platform might change the application is going to be SaaS or on-premises or whatever it might be but the, those three fundamental things irrespective of what you do in in technology are required to deliver the out outcome that you want and he was just telling it oh, that's a nice way of thinking about it yeah I might take that one and then he's now building his strategy <laughs> based on that so I was like fantastic just steal my idea <laughs> <laughs> well that's like like we just discussed right that's you're giving your point of view from uh, from where you're comfortable. And that gave him an idea of, of how to do it in, in his environment or his kind of specific um, uh, scope of control or domain. So that, that that's kind of where I was at with that, having an opinion, being able to articulate on it, 
and that might in inspire other people to do something different. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the thing that really inspire people to do things different. There's too many people doing the same thing at the moment, that's for sure. Okay, so um, if we think about the current pandemic, right, and it's, it's having a lot of negative, and in some cases, some some positives, right, out the back of this. Um, what do you see is like the biggest positive and negative that you're seeing at the minute? Um, I think the, the biggest negative is the, the social aspect, right? Everybody um, is moving towards working from home and um, like we're doing right now, we're on a Zoom meeting. Um, I've got another six Zoom meetings or WebExes or GoToMeetings today. So at a certain point, you just get sick and tired of the interface. And I know that Zoom is adding a lot of these filters and, and you can do happy faces and, and this, the, the gangster sunglasses. Um, but that, that kind of, you know, the social element is different than working from an office or, or, or you know, being, being at a customer site. Um, so that's for me, the, the biggest negative is not able to walk to somebody's desk and it, just have small chat. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest plus is that a lot of organizations that were not able to see the added value of um, working remotely are now opening up and they're seeing the the additional benefit of of all of that not just for employees but you know in in the, the larger uh, uh grand of scheme is that you know uh, people are traveling less there's less pollution there's um different energy consumption and all of that so you know, from a from a positive perspective i think the world has shown that we're able to adapt to this situation and th that's something that um is not per se technology driven, uh, but the fact that we're able to say, all right, let's move our business model into something completely different or move our way of our habits to something different is something that um, that impresses me because it's not, you know, it's not Utrecht where I live. It's not the Netherlands. It's not uh, Europe. It's worldwide. And everybody is, is kind of moving into this new normal. I don't like the phrasing, but the, the new normal. Um, it's something that that I think is impressive to see that we're still able to actually make a change. Yeah, yeah, and, and I've got a, there's another session I did the other evening with um, Bradley Wilkie where we he sent me a, a Oculus VR headset in the post and we created a, a Mr. Tech Talk home and we basically did the entire interview in a virtual building, right? And we went into a sauna, a bit weird. We then went into the living space, the balcony and the top of a, of a snowy mountain and had these conversations. And it was it was different. Right. But what, one of the things that I was thinking of from a conference perspective, right, where a lot of us all get together and we chat and all those kind of things. And you can't do that on Zoom calls because breakout rooms are great. Then you got you got to decide which breakout room you're going into. You can't just drop into conversations. And one of the things that he's got in that platform is the, the concept of 3D sound with the VR headset. So you could have a room of people. You can walk over into that area and hear just their conversation. You could stand in the middle and hear dips of everyone's, or you could go over into that area and have that conversation. So for me, leveraging that technology in the situation we're in now could be extremely powerful for the people that provide the conferences, whether that's Nutanix, VMware, Microsoft, Citrix, whoever, to try and get us to be more socially interactive than just attending these these web-driven um, events that are happening at the moment because it's lacking in community involvement. No, oh, absolutely. And I see that across the board that people are, um, so even with the, the Dutch Citrix user group, which I'm uh, part of the uh, the um, um, committee, um, we try to do an online um, session, but you just see that the, the, um, the focus and the drive to actually attend those are less because of the lack of social. I mean, part of part of me going to events is not the sessions by itself. It's talking to people like you face to face, um, have, having a dinner with with people, drinking a beer, or um, in my case, sparkling water. Um, you know, that's kind of what what drives the um, the the social aspect of, of of these gatherings. And I think that um, that most of the times, most of these events, I get more um, talking to specialists and talking to people directly than attending a session with all the respect for the people presenting. Cause I've been, I've been in that spot a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree on that. I think if I think about a couple of VM worlds I've been to over the years where I've probably only attended four or five sessions over the entire course of the, uh, of the event and then spent the rest of my time in the solutions expo or in the, the hall talking to people or peering at a, a separate breakout session. That's nothing to even do with VM world. Right. And things like that. And, 
for me, the, that's the value in those areas. The sessions are great. The sessions are generally on demand as well. So you can go and watch them back later. I can't catch up with the person face to face later because they're going to be in another country potentially. No, 100%. So, um, yeah, technology might be able to help with that, but I don't think we'll ever get close to uh, sitting side by side, um, you know, ordering steak or, or beers. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, do you think there's any um, unsung heroes of technology? So, areas of technology that people should be using that they're not. Uh, and an example I use on this is things like Microsoft Flow, right? Um, most people have it as part of their Microsoft licensing. They can use it to automate some mundane tasks. And it's actually just click and point, drag and drop scenarios, as long as you know the process of what you're trying to mm -hmm. achieve. Is there anything that, that you think is unsung that people need to be aware of? Um, I think that's a good, good question. So in terms of technology, I know that, um, that you know, we discussed that uh, previously, but I uh, dabble around with IoT a lot. Um, so I, I, I like home automation. And I know it's upcoming, but I think that um, um, you know just the the fact that we're able to um, create a better life experience by using automation at home um, helps immensely. And I know a lot of people are still afraid of it because there's security implement uh, implications and whatnot. You, know, you can kind of mitigate that by keeping things local or se segmenting out on the network. But I I, I honestly think that um, that home automation will drive a lot of enterprise automation as well. Yeah. As we've seen with um, numerous accounts of technology, uh, just take Windows and Office, for example, um, home usage has have driven that, that usage into the enterprise as well. And that, that's what I see for um, automation and IoT as well. Um, the more we'll use it at home and, and drive consumer adoption, the more would be the new standard in enterprises as well. And that will make our lives a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, do you think there's any areas in enterprise IT that organizations just undervalue or underinvest in? <laughs> um, well, working at Nutanix, uh, there, there might be an obvious answer to that, <laughs> um, but I won't, I, won't, <laughs> I won't give that answer. I think the, the biggest area that people, that organizations are undervaluing or not investing in is their actual workforce. Um, and with that is that, you know, when I try, when I say that, I, I actually mean that, um, and I'll give you an example. So a while back we did an implementation for a hospital. It was about 15,000 seats and we were looking at creating the designs and I was actually reviewing some of the high level designs. And then the CTO of that organization asked us to stop because he wanted to listen to ideas that we had to create a, a even better platform. And I actually asked him um, if he ever spent time with uh, nurses on, on the floor itself. Like, did he, did he ever spend time on, on a cow, a uh, computer on wheels, like these things yeah. that they have yeah. in the hospital? And he looked at me and he, he went kind of weird. Um, he looked at me and go like, why should I do that? And I'm like, well, those are the people you're actually building this stuff for. So if you're asking for ideas that are semi out of the box, why not spend a day or two on the floor running, see what they're doing, see how their processes work, see how they're kind of working their way around processes, because chances are that they're not following whatever you designed. Yeah. Right. There's a, uh, um, uh, a graphic somewhere on the internet that says um, architectural design and it's it's a footpath it's like grass and then there's a, a trail yeah, right there <laughs> yeah. that's kind of the image that I had and he, he actually took that advice he spent a, a couple of days in different hospitals just walking around on the floor and he, he noticed that people are, are trying to take shortcuts or do th things differently and we're, we were able to adapt to that and um, no, the, the, the moral of that story is that I think that the biggest thing that is undervalued is opinion of people that have to work with whatever we build. Yeah. Um, there's still a, a kind of a, a stigma on IT that we should dictate whatever uh, end users are using. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the battle that I've been fighting uh, ever since I, I started in IT is that if you build something for someone, it needs to be usable for that someone and not whatever, like it, it shouldn't be a glorified echo or eco project for me to show off um, my, my coding skills, right? So um, 
when we when we when I think about undervalued and un, un, um, underinvested, I think it's the actual end user, not the technology itself. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that, that makes sense. the amount of times that we, I get involved in conversations where it's like, so is this is this right? Is this what you're after? Just a very simple, right? Device choice, right? Yeah. Oh, we're going to buy ten thousand Surface Pros, right? And I'm like, are you sure? Is that what people yeah. want? Do they know, is it is it right for them? Is it light enough, it's portable enough. Are they happy with the little flappy thing at the back, digging into the leg on a train or whatever? Are they happy watching, like in my scenario, right? I sat on a train and had the Surface Pro on and then the train jolted and then the 2000 pound device went flying down the train and I'm left with like a hundred dollar keyboard. And it's like, oh, great. <laughs> um, so th there's those kind of things. That I think everyone has, a, has an opinion of what they'd like to use. And I've always said in the past that I feel more productive on a Mac. Am I more productive on a Mac versus a window machine? Probably not, right? And the actual recognition for that for me is I've just moved back to Windows, like literally over the last two weeks. And that's purely because my Mac Pro created a mini mushroom cloud. And decided when it was really warm, it overheated. It's, it's not very good at, uh, at keeping itself cool anyway. And then it, it died finally after many, many years of use. So I've gone out and I thought, do you know what? I'm going to go have change. I'm going to go back to Windows again and see what it's like. And actually, I'm just as productive. But personally, as an opinion, I felt I was more productive on the Mac. So if someone had given me a Windows device when I was in that mindset, I'd have just gone, <laughs> no. And I'd have used yeah. the Windows device for propping a window open or something instead. Um, awesome. So let's um, let's do the lightning round. So quick, snappy questions and answers, um, and then we can call it quits and get to our daily, day, day lives. So yeah. um, last technology purchase. Two fire sticks, an Amazon Echo, and a Blinky. Prime day. <laughs> Prime day. <laughs> Uh, who's your biggest inspiration? My wife. Perfect. Uh, what does work-life balance mean to you? Uh, there is no work-life balance. Well, uh, I, um, I'm, I'm not defined by, uh, by any of those. So um, I'm just me being me. And if that means I'm, I'm playing around with my kids or um, you know, attending soccer training or football training or whatever training or, or working, uh, it's just me being me. Yeah. Uh, what did you want to do when you finished school? Uh, two answers. I wanted to be an archaeologist at first. Turned out to uh, to you know end up in in cutting edge technology. Um, but I was actually schooled as a, uh, I've got a bachelor's degrees in uh, commercial economics. Oh, okay, different different life. The amount of people that go and do all these fantastic degrees and things, right, and then end up in IT. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it was the best thing I could do. <laughs> Uh, what's your favorite book? The Subtle Art of Not Giving Up. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll put a link to that somewhere as well so people can go and see that one. Uh, most important thing to you? Happiness and health of the people around me. Cool. Uh, what would be your words of wisdom if it was in a tweet? <laughs> um, I think I tweeted it just recently, and it, it's a quote from, uh, from somebody that, uh, that gave me training once on uh, a product called REST Automation Manager. Yep. And um, the, the guy on the is a, uh, he was a brilliant mind. He's still a brilliant mind. But um, the quote that he had was, a fool with a tool is still a powerful one. Or a, no, no, it was um, a tool, a fool with a tool is still a fool, but a powerful one. Yeah. And that's something that, that you know, sticks to me because Either way you look at it, in whatever scenario you look at it, it, it kind of makes sense. Basically, it, it says don't don't be a dumbass and think before you do. Yeah. Right. The tool to do your job, whatever the tool is, a Mac or, or automation or a mindset or or maybe knowledge or a role. Um, doesn't matter if you have it. If you're an if you're an idiot, you're still an idiot. But you you just have something to enable yourself. So um, that 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 quote. Um, you know, stuck with me for, uh, I think that training is easily 18 years back. So uh, yeah, it, it did make an impression. Perfect. And what, what was your favorite song is? Oh, wow. My favorite song, uh, First Rebirth from uh, Svensson and Johansson. I'm not sure if you know it. Uh, I'm going to have to try and find it. <laughs> it. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people will, uh, will, will know it, but it's, 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 um, um early rave it's it's one of my favorite songs all time 
Um, I remember walking in into a, um, uh, a a party with fifteen thousand people, and that song came up, and I still get goosebumps when that when that when the first tunes of the song play. Yeah. Okay. Next one. So fill in the blank. The new normal is horrible. <laughs> uh, must watch TV show. Uh I don't watch a lot of TV, but I think it, 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 if I have to name one, it's something with barbecue. Okay. And favorite junk food? Uh, so I skipped, uh, so I started doing low carbs three years back. Um, so I don't eat a lot of junk food, but if, if it's junk food, it's probably, oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it's probably going to be just a hamburger or something, something with meat. And without yeah. the patty. Yeah, definitely. I, I do have a burger now, to be fair. So, so I think on, on that note, we can probably call it uh, call it quits. So yeah, thank you very much for your time. It's been great hearing about, about your experiences and hopefully someone can take some something away from this session. Cool. Thank you, Cal. Cheers.